through Revelation in chapters 1 and 2 uh, where there are seven letters that are being issued to seven churches in that period of time where they were living. And all seven letters are, uh, they were given to the leader of the church to uh, commend, to discipline, to do a lot of things. But remember, Revelation is the book of the revealing of Jesus Christ. I heard somebody say, uh, as I was listening to a sermon not too long ago, yes, I listen to other people's messages sometimes. I don't all the time, but there are sometimes I do. And this one time I was listening to this message, I heard this man say as he was preaching, he said, we keep trying to live out of the book of Acts. He said, but we're no longer living in the book of Acts. We're living in the book of Revelation. And we need to really take Revelation and take it apart and unveil Jesus in this book. It really is fascinating. So these seven letters to seven churches are actually seven letters that speak of the types of churches that are in the land during the last days, okay? And up to and during the last days. It's in Revelation because this is about the end of all of the things that are going to come on the earth, you know, before Jesus comes and after Jesus comes back to capture the warrior bride away with him. And so as we read this, we're going to skip all of these letters. And I want to focus in on one today because I believe God is having to unveil what has been going on with the church world and the church even the religious church, in order for us to be able to pray more effectively. That's why intercessors are being called to rise up. Do you know every one of you have the uh, gift of intercession in you? And some people say, oh, well, that's a special gift. Well, it may be every one of us has got it. <laughs> so all we have to do is learn how to fall down on our knees and pray a lot before God and intercede and pray in the spirit because it's the spirit, the unknown language, that prays the will of the Father. And that's what intercession does. Intercession wages war. Intercession does a lot of stuff. When I get in conflict, when I get in trouble, I start praying in the spirit. You know, I start interceding. Not my English words. I don't know what to say. I'm not that smart. You know, I need to pray the mind and the will of Father God. And when I get into that spiritual mode of interceding, for what's going on in my life in that crisis or that situation that I'm telling you the truth heaven comes down and God starts the angels start moving out taking their position around me and are going to work to change the dynamics of whatever I'm facing in my life that's the power of intercession and just so you get it Everybody in here has the power of intercession inside of them. Some people pull that off to the side and said it's a special gift. Well, I agree that there's more people that like to pray than others. And all we have to prove that out is to call a prayer meeting to this house. And then we see how many show up that like to pray. But you have that anointing inside of you to pray in intercession. So God is wanting to show us in this particular passage, he brought it out to me, and we're, it's the church of Pergamon. And so we're going to begin in uh, Revelation 2, verse 12, and I'm reading it out of the message. He said, write this to Pergamon, to the angel of the church, which is the leader, the one with the sharp biting sword draws from the sheath of his mouth, out comes the sword words. Here's what he said, quote, I see where you live right under the shadow of Satan's throne, but you continue boldly in my name. You never once denied my name, even when the pressure was worst, when they martyred Antipas, my witness who stayed faithful to me on Satan's turf. But why do you indulge that Balaam crowd? Don't you remember that Balaam was an enemy agent seducing Balak and sabotaging Israel's holy pil pilgrimage pilgrimage by throwing unholy parties 
And why do you put up with the Nicolaitans who do the same things? Enough. Don't give in to them. I'll be with you soon. I'm fed up and about to cut them to pieces with my sharp sword, sword sharp words. Are your ears away? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. I'll give the sacred manna to every conqueror. I'll also give a clear, smooth stone inscribed with your new name, your secret new name. Now, I know you're thinking, well, what in the world does that have to do? But I want to point out your attention that they were living right under the shadows of Satan's throne. And what they were doing were they were being silent. They became the compromising church because they compromised doctrine. They were silent about sin. Now, I know that God is a God of love. Please hear that. But we need to get back to the fact that God is also a God who cannot hear us when there is sin in the camp. And we have the history of the Israelites' children as God dealt with them over and over and over again. And last week I told you it was a cycle. They would worship God and then they would be drawn away. They would sit under the shadow of Satan. And some would succumb to that. Some would, could, would succumb. And they would sin against God. Others would just sit under the shadow of it. But here, to, here today, we need to know that the Lord is saying to us that there has been a compromising church that has refused to speak forth my voice and my words. See, they were, they were commended. I mean, they, they didn't leave the Lord. Look at the church world today. What do you see? There are nameless people we could call by name. You know, you know their names. I know their names, but we're calling them nameless. Who claim to worship God. Who claim to be a Christian. But we see them over sitting under the shadow of Satan's throne. They're in, in, in getting up as close as they can to it through compromise and without saying anything at all about what's going on. See, I, I went through places where I, I dealt with people and I, I when I first came here, I remember it. Woo, I had some letters written to me. You know why? Because I didn't put up with and deal with sin. That's right, in the beginning. I mean, I nipped it off. If I saw that somebody was, there was gossip or there was something going on out in the congregation, I came to this pulpit, I exposed it with my mouth, I didn't call names. And you know how that makes you feel when you're called on the carpet. But let me tell you something, our God is a God of justice. Do you hear that? He cannot look on sin. Then through the years, I began to let the love of Jesus inside of me reach out to people in a different way. And here's what I've learned in 21, almost 21 years or 22 years, I've lost count. But anyway, here's what, is it one or two? <laughs> okay, two. Uh, here's what I've learned in that amount of time. You can say anything you need to say to a person if you do it with love. If they know you love them, and that you're concerned them because you love them and you're concerned about them. They may go away, but let me tell you something. Their soul is no longer required of you. And, you know, we're in the day and age where the church has set back. We've been silent on all the major issues that have been going on. We've let things go on. We've not stood up and had an opinion or a voice but boy have we had an opinion about each other we have crucified each other in the building and outside the building and we all need to just throw up our hands and say lord we're guilty forgive us amen because that's what's been going on so this pergamos was soft on sin and compromised uh, and you can't be soft on sin and compromise please hear that Understand, God is love, but to think that God never speaks and disciplines one of his children 
is a bald faced lie from the pit of hell and it's time for it to be exposed in the pulpit from the pulpit to the pews and the pews to the pulpit because it goes both ways amen and so it's not healthy it's not god honoring and jesus began to challenge us through what john saw in this letter he began to challenge the compromisers and you know you know what a compromise of church is I've been there. I've seen it. I, I have to say that I've had to repent over some of the things that I've done in my 22 years of ministry. Why? Because I thought it was the right thing to do. But it's not about the right thing to do. Do you hear that? It's about this word and what this word says to do. It's not our opinion of whether it's good or evil right but it's god's opinion about what to say on the matter and the new new testament is truly clear about what we should be saying about the issues and about things because see you know a compromise in church says oh everybody just come on in just we accept everybody we accept everything and it's true god loves the sinner you've heard that and he does and i'll never forget one service we had here um we had a couple that was part of our church at that time, and I didn't know. They had a son, and we loved him. He would come and visit sometimes, and we would just have such a good rapport. And But one Sunday, I got up, and I began to speak God's word regarding homosexuality, all right? And as I began to speak that, I had no, I, matter of fact, it was one of those inspirational messages that the Lord said, do this instead of doing that. And so I did that, and I had no idea. Do you know that that person that was sitting in the pew was engaged in homosexual behavior and homosexual activity? But I watched the Lord come and wash him whiter than snow. You know why? Because you cannot resist this word. This is the infallible word of God. And I didn't do it with ugliness, you know, but I just read the word. Let me tell you something. Our young people are confused about their sexuality. They don't know whether they're male or female. They, can, they think they can be either or or have a sex change and change. Now, I'm being rough this morning, I know. But it's time for the truth to come forth. We have a, a disturbed, confused society of young people. And, you know, the big deal about the Netflix movie with the child pornography or the child, uh, what do you call that, slavery or whatever. You know, the thing about it is... I went to a particular, I was invited to speak at a particular meeting, and I was just, I almost had to get up and leave. Because they had a group of young kids down to age five, and they were dancing a song, and they had hardly any clothes on from age five, makeup, everything all the way up to teenagers 15 16 17 years old and they dance the most perverted sexual horrible dance i have ever seen in my life it took everything in me as being the speaker to sit that and go through that as i watched parents who have allowed their children to go dressed with no clothes on, hardly, and then taught them those horrible, perverted acts. And then we wonder why there's so much child sex trafficking. I'm telling you why. It's because it's allowed and it begins in the home. And what we teach in the home is what our kids are gonna do out there. You go take cheerleading, I'm sorry. We start looking at all this stuff. Our so young society has been taught to wear nothing and act like whatever that's permissible for them to have sex at early ages. I'm talking about before they even hit 13. Are you listening? And the church, the compromised church, has sat by silent and 
and we have allowed things to go on. You know, I love my baby girl. Everybody knows I got a, a little granddaughter. She's, um, I've got several, and I love them all, but I'm keeping the youngest one, okay? And so it just happens that this has cha changed my life. It has brought back my joy. We laugh all the time. But what I've learned with her, I can teach her to do things, and she will mimic me. That is right. We work at, uh, you know, waving. She knows now this is hello and this is bye-bye. She knows that this is praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And her parents can figure out what she's doing like this. But I knew because I told her to praise the Lord. Now I just got to get her. She's getting to where she's putting both hands up now. You know, and to think that I'm, that this little baby girl and my other little granddaughters are, are going to grow up unless their parents or their grandparents teach them how to live godly and not ungodly. And so we're in this age of compromise where everything is compromised. The kids are just going crazy and everything. So the compromised church often lacks boldness. It won't speak out. You know why? It's easier to be passive. Well, how do I change that? How do I get that change in society? How do I pray over that? Well, we start praying for encounters of the God kind over parents' lives. That's where it comes from. It's going to be trained from the cradle. They will grow up mimicking what they learn at home. And you know, I taught her some things that I've had to unteach her some things because I didn't realize I did it in fun, but she's not old enough to understand the difference of when it's proper to do it or when it's not proper to do it. And so I've had to go back and say, no, 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 sorry, baby. I, you know, and here I am talking to a baby, trying to explain why I didn't teach her the right thing, why I taught her something she shouldn't have learned. I'm telling you, today it is important in order for society to change, we must change our viewpoint and understand where the church is. You may not be that compromised person in the church. You may be doing great, good, and fine, and you may have taught your kids, and they're all living holy lives, and everything is perfect in them. But I'm telling you, even teaching them the Word of God, they must be taught how to stand against all this stuff that is coming against our young people. They don't know who they are. They are searching and seeking and everyone know how to find out who they are. And some are settling for things that they should not be. Because see, the Pergamos Church, the Compromised Church, is going to please men. It's not going to speak the truth. I think of all the years when I was young, when I had just first come to the Lord, I thought of how many times that I was so hard. I would, <laughs> Bobby can remember this really well when, when I first started out. I didn't know I had a prophet's voice. I didn't know I had that kind of trumpet voice. So I'd get up to preach and the spirit would come on me and man, I would just sound the alarm. And then when, I'd, when, when we'd say amen, Everybody be gone, but man, I think, boy, that must have been a rough one for them to take, you know, because they're gone. It's a good thing I don't have to do that every week. But God wants us to know that he loves us, but we cannot sit at the seat of Satan and stay silent and let things go on. See, God's got a plan. Now, see, I want to show you something. So what was he telling purpose? He said, you better wake up. I'm getting ready to hit that that's going on, that you've allowed, that you've put up with. I'm getting ready to hit that. Now, here's one thing that I want to tell you about the Lord. Because see, we have New Testament grace. Everybody say grace, grace. grace, grace, grace. Thank you, Jesus, for grace. Thank you, Jesus. But how many know that David was faced at the fact that the Lord's spirit would not always strive with men? Do you remember that? Did we throw the Old Testament out? No. That is for our learning. Those are our examples. That's our, that's our, our way to uh, anchor. We anchor to the Old Testament because the stories are for us. They are us. Amen? Before grace. 
So God is a God where this new covenant where he's just love, 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 and he does love you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he will forgive you when you sincerely come to him and you ask him to forgive you. And how many go to the fountain every day? I do. You know why? Because I sin daily. You say, oh, but you're a Christian. You're, you're, not, a, you're not a sinner. No, I'm not a sinner, but I want to make sure that everything in my heart is right. I go to the cross daily at the cross where I first saw the light. I want to make sure those ugly words I spoke to Bill back there during the day, you know, and been ugly to him. I want to make sure that I've gotten that out of me. Because if it doesn't get out of me, that grows and grows and grows. It gets bigger and I get uglier. And the monster begins to come out in me. And you do not want to see the monster. It very rarely comes out, but you don't want to see the monster in me, right? And what, what is that monster? It's my humanness. It's my flesh. It's not my new life in Christ. I've just allowed my human nature and the humanness in me to override the new life of God in me that has the joy of the Lord that is my strength, right? And so I, can, I have to deal with myself on a daily basis because the Lord constantly wants us to deal with it. So let's look at some scripture and see what the Lord says about his justice because he does have justice. And I believe the Christian church, because of compromise, has forgotten that God is a God of justice. That's what's going on in the earth today. He shut church down. He closed it. I mean, he shut it down. Why? Because he needs to get our attention. He needs to wake us up before we all come back and start doing the same things we've done over and over again. He wants us to know that there are issues that cannot be reached by his love and his mercy until we get out of this compromising condition. So, 1 John, um, not 1 John, but John 3 and 36 says the wrath of God is currently and continually abiding upon all those who reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Everybody is not going to heaven. Amen? I wish you were, but everybody is not going to heaven. Who is going to heaven? John 3, 16. What? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will have a ticket to heaven. Will have everlasting life. That's the only way. Jesus is the way. And then in Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 16. Everybody knows the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Those were believers. And they came in and they lied to the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? They lied to the Holy Spirit. And Peter, you know, called them up on it, didn't he? He said, you, you didn't have to sell this land. They were, people were going out, selling their land, bringing their, their resources into the kingdom of God. And they did the same thing, but they held back part of it and lied, pretended that they had given it all. Oh, you say, well, that don't happen today. Oh, yes, it does. Let's just do this little business over here on the side. We won't tell anybody. Right? When we fail to be obedient to his word, then we have to suffer his consequences. And he cannot look on sin. And then in Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 24, and I'm not reading these for sake of time. I just want to make a reference with them. King Herod is struck dead by an angel of the Lord for not giving God glory. You know what happened when we testify? It's not about what we did. You know, and as I started giving that testimony and telling about how I laid hands, that I kept going in my head. You better tone that down. You better tone. Anybody, can anybody relate with me is what I'm saying. You don't do anything. You are just a vessel. And you are only an honorable vessel when you give all the glory to God. 
We don't even have to say we did it. We can say, you know, I know, I know of uh, this uh, situation where this man had cancer and this person full of the spirit and power of God came and cursed that thing from the root. Are you hearing the difference in what I'm saying right now to what I said a while ago when I gave that testimony? A while ago, it was my humanness. See, your humanness operates first. That's why we stay in compromise. That's why we don't want to get into conflict with other people and stand for the word of God because they have an opinion and we should respect that. We should listen to their opinion and not get angry, but they should listen to our word based on the word. Amen? So it's not about what we do. It's about what this word says. And the Lord says the word is the most important thing you've got in your hand right now. You know how to use the name of Jesus. But if you don't have this word hidden in your heart, why do you hide it in your heart? I have your word in my heart, Lord, that I might not sin against you. So see, God, it, it, he does not look on sin. And here we see King Herod, because he would not give glory to God, he gave glory to himself, God struck him dead. And then Acts chapter 13, verse 8 through uh, 11, um, Elimus, the magician, everybody knows him. He struck by, blind, by the hand of the Lord, is what the scripture says, for being a fraud and son of the devil. That's what he was. Romans 1, 18 through 24 says, The wrath of God is revealed toward humanity by allowing them to reap what they sow. Therefore, God gave them over. What did he give them over to? A reprobate mind, a mind that could no longer function like it needed to. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13, we see where an immoral brother is judged and he's handed over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. And then Hymenaeus and Alexander were delivered to Satan for blasphemy in 1 Timothy 1, 20. See, we think we're not doing any of this stuff. You know, and then we have Jezebel. How many know Jezebel was thrown on a bed or violent sickness and those who commit adultery with her into terror unless they repent of her deeds? Now, I've seen a lot of stuff. Everybody knows the, the uh, woman chief justice of the Supreme Court died on, get this, Rosh Hashanah, the, Jewish, the beginning of the Jewish New Year, which was... Friday at sundown to yesterday at sundown. And, you know, there are people singing her praises. There are people just talking about all the good things she did. Your goodness will not get you to heaven this morning. <laughs> Only your sins covered by the blood of Jesus will get you to heaven. And if you don't repent before you die, you are going to face the judgment and wrath of a holy God. Do you know that the word says that one day every person will stand before him and give an account of their life? And then another scripture says that you will even be judged for every idle word. Oh, dear Lord, help us. Help the church, Lord. <laughs> help the church. To walk in repentance, to repent of our evil deeds, from sitting under Satan's uh, throne, playing around with Satan's throne, so to speak. Maybe not uh, committing or comprom you know, compromising in that, but just the fact that you're too close to Satan and not sitting under God's throne. My goodness, wouldn't you rather sit under the throne in the grace of God? Yes. And then... He also said about Jezebel, he said, Furthermore, I, Jesus, will strike her followers with a deadly disease, and then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. I will repay each one of you what your deeds deserve. And then Proverbs 11.10 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 and then Proverbs 11, 10, where, where the, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. When the wicked perish. You know, God doesn't want any to fall short of his glory. God wants everyone to come into the saving knowledge of him. 
But I'm telling you today that it is time for us as the people of God, as the church of God, to rise up. Now, go back to Isaiah chapter 66, and let's see what the word says we can do with that. Because we all know, and it's a wonderful passage of scripture, and I love it. And I can, um, I can still hear the War Room movie, and you know, this was kind of based in that area. Wake up, arise. And this is what 66.1 says. I believe it's 66. Is it maybe 60? Is it 66? Anyway, whatever. You can check it out later. But uh, I forgot to bring it over in my notes. So it says, Arise, shine, light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon who? Me. Upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Are we in that place right now in the earth? Yes. There is war in the earth between parties and fractions and there's division. We see even the church divided on issues. But I want to tell you that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is getting, is arising. And we are shining. Why? Because the glory of the Lord is risen. When it's risen upon us, it's not only coming down on us, but it's coming out of us. And people are drawn to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the deep darkness, the people, look at confusion. Look at all of the things that are going on. But my God is greater than all of that. And I have said this. I'll say it again. It matters not the man in the office. <laughs> you need to quit compromising what you believe and what you know this word of God is speaking. And we need to arise and shine. It says, but the Lord, even the deep darkness for the people, the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. See, something happens when the inside of us catches fire again. When that spark begins to ignite on the inside of us, then God is getting ready to shine his glory on you, on me, in tangible ways that we will shine brighter than the stars. And look, I'm not worried about going on you don't need to be worried you just need to know your God that's what you need to do and you need to take it to prayer I need to take it to prayer we need to begin to pray and intercede for each other we need to begin to pray and intercede for this nation we need to begin to pray and intercede over this election we need to begin to cast down the dark and all of these other things that are taking place right under our eyes we need to pray and intercede for our children. We need to pray and intercede for our young people. We need to pray, 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 and not be a compromising group of people who do not have any intestinal fortitude, who cannot stand up and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what he's saying. Don't be ashamed of me. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up with my word. Not not your words, not your opinion, but stand up with my words in your mouth and you will go forth like a two-edged sword defeating the enemy. That's how we save our country. That's how we save our land. It's not too late. Hallelujah. I believe that with all of my heart. If God said, if my people, I keep saying it over and over and over again, if my people who will call by my name will humble themselves and turn away from their wicked way, then I'll come and I'll heal their land. If you want your body healed, if you want your your family healed, if you want your church healed, if you want your children healed, if you want your country healed, then you've got to begin to humble yourself and admit when you've been a compromising person, confesses his sin, and turn away from it, become a new life person, let that light, that new life person in you begin to function instead of that human nature person. 
And that's where we are. It's another place that God is just saying over and over and over again, get it right. Get it right. Be aware that you may think you're not compromising, but you just compromise when you allow something else over here of the world to pull you that way instead of into me. Amen? And I mean, it's time. How many believe it's time? It's past time, actually. It's more than past time. And I believe there are some of us in here today who are going to shine like the brightest light bulb in the world. And I don't know what that is, but I know it's Jesus. And I believe that none of us are going to be left behind. Amen. Amen. Why? Because God has a plan for you and he has a plan for me. But he wants me to learn to pray effectively. And if I don't know what I'm, what's going on out here, like we know in the world, we know the election needs prayer. Lord, we know the news media needs prayer, right? Oh, my goodness, we know, we just start counting everything, our kids, our children, you know, uh, battered women. We just go on and on, race, genders, uh, just all sorts of evilness. And the darkness is rising over the people. Do you hear that prophetic word? And as the darkness rises, God's people begin to say, no, no, no more, God. Forgive me for having a compromising spirit. Forgive me just when people are talking about abortion, I just stay silent. You know, forgive me, God, for not taking a stand. And as we begin to confess our sin of compromise, he is faithful and just to forgive us of that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever had a traumatic event in your life and all through your life you just keep seeing pictures or, you know, and it fades some at times, but then, you know, later on in your life, you, if it, those images begin to come back and you begin to return and you begin to remember the things that were so hurtful and painful and traumatic and really, truly just altered who you were as a person. Any, can anybody relate to that? Well, let me tell you how to cancel that, that in your life. It is simply by pouring the blood of Jesus over you. You know, when I'm applying his blood, nothing else is there. When I'm praying, when I'm interceding, when I'm crying out to God, he begins to take those things and fade them out of our life completely. Just like he did that cancer. Amen? Now, I don't understand the processes that happen, and I don't understand again why God, it seems that God allows some things and doesn't. But I want, to, I want to say this to you. It is not God that does not heal. That's right. It is not God that allows, well, he does. It is in his permissive will because we're living in a world where Satan thinks, did you hear what I said? He thinks he controls the world. He thinks he controls us. But I got news for you. He is not my God of this world. <laughs> and he will not control what goes on in my life. So what do I do? I stay in a place of intercessory prayer and I pray. And then the memories that I have are good memories. And they're right memories. And they're right on in what God wants me to remember in that traumatic event. Now you say, well, you've never had a traumatic event. I beg your pardon. You don't know me. And here's one thing that some of you may know about me. If I need prayer, I won't call. I'm like brother in the back. <laughs> you know, I won't call you and ask you to pray for me. Why? Because I believe I hear all the eyes. I believe I should handle that myself. But you know what? That is not right in me. Why? Because we should call for prayer. When it's something we can't handle, we should call for prayer. And so I'm calling you for prayer this morning. And, um, you know, I just thank you for those that are on Facebook. You can go ahead and cut that off if you will. I thank you for being here. 